I'm kicking this off today, so uh, just to say, about three years ago, a colleague of mine emailed um, to me and uh, he said that there's uh, an extremely bright and mature 25 year old student that's interested in coming to SAS. It, it was you, by the way, Nancy. Um, this is Brendan I'm talking about. Um, and wants advice on how to apply uh, to the anthropology department to help us do one of the MAs there. Um, and I think when we got in touch, you know, I found out you're already writing uh, pieces for the Economic and Political Weekly, uh, which is a, a sort of a very important, very influential uh, journal uh, in India. Um, so, you know, it was an obvious fit uh, with the anthropology department, uh, and I was very pleased when you did come here, and also to find out back here as well. Uh, and we were, you know, able to meet and, uh, and, and you indeed took the course in, uh, in political ecology of, of development, uh, which um, today's talk uh, directly relates to, covers a lot of the same areas that we look at on uh, uh, political ecology of development. Um, and yeah, looking here to, forward to hearing more about it, there, there is the excellent um, article in uh, Economic and Political Weekly written with uh, Ajit Menon, uh, which I do recommend as well. Um, but I think you're also going to talk about some new material. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much, Richard, for being here today and for that introduction. And thank you all for coming. It's really great to have you. And like Richard said, I'm presenting some of the materials that I wrote about in my paper and also sharing with you some new materials. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, my work is mostly around issues of identity and forest rights and indigeneity. So I'll just uh, begin by bringing you to these boards, um, which have been put up in a village in Gudalur, which is where I do my field work. Uh, so Gudalur lies at the heart of an ecologically sensitive area. And so it's right at the center of six different national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, and tiger reserves. And um, because it's a region that's so central to conservation, communities have faced continual harassment at the hands of the forest department. And they've been resettled and relocated multiple times from protected areas. And um, in the village where these boards have put, been put up, there are at least three different ethnic communities who all live side by side. Um, and because Gudalur is at the, right at the heart of the three South Indian states of Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and Kerala, it's a sort of a melting pot of identities of sorts. Um, so you have tribal communities, um, and you also have autochthonous settled agriculturalists who are not actually classified as tribal. Um, but the landscapes of Gudalur have also been marked by the plantation economy ever since the colonial period. Um, and colonial planters needed to bring labor for the plantations from other parts of South India. So um, that was your first wave of migration into Gudalur. And then after independence, the Indian state uh, wanted to create sort of economic self-sufficiency and autarky for the independent state of India. And they started to grow more food movement, which encouraged not just laborers, but also small and marginalized farmers from neighboring states to settle in Gudalur. Um, and most recently, around the late 1960s and early 1970s, um, you have Tamils from Sri Lanka who have been repatriated to India under this sort of bilateral agreement between the two governments. And um, these Tamils are originally Indian Tamils. And they were sent in the colonial period from Tamil Nadu in India to work on the plantations of Sri Lanka. And um, now they've been resettled around tea plantations across South India, and they've been given employment on these tea plantations. Um, and in this particular settlement where you find this board, um, you have a tribal colony that consists of these mud huts and alongside this river. And in very clo close proxim proximity, to the colony, you find Tamil repatriates. And uh, many of the Tamils have intermarried with the tribals, and they also live in the colony now. Um, and nearby, there are also small farmers from the neighboring state of Kerala. And they now speak the tribal uh, languages of the region fluently. Um, there are also here Tamil plantation laborers who settled uh, in the region from the colonial period. So that's just to give you a sense of how heterogeneous this settlement is in terms of identity. Um, and I want to bring your attention to that because these conflations of identity are one of the main reasons 
that there's been a lot of debate and contestation around just a simple act of putting up this board itself. So the board declares in Tamil that um, this village has rights under the Forest Rights Act of 2006. Um, and I'll refer to the Forest Rights Act in this talk from here on as the FRA. Um, so the FRA marked a watershed moment for forest governance in India uh, by recognizing the rights of communities that have traditionally used and occupied India's forest lands. And the boards were put up by an organization that represents the interests of small farmers and landless laborers. And this organization conceives of itself sort of along the lines of a trade union or a mass organization. And when the boards were put up, uh, tribal NGOs in the region took great issue with the boards um, because they were arguing that these boards imply that all communities in the region can claim rights under the FRA. But the FRA itself provides for the rights only of tribal communities and also communities that can prove um, occupation on forest lands for three generations. And um, in addition to this sort of narrow legal concern, there was also a broader concern here about the erosion of tribal culture because of intermarriage and modernization and so on. So um, the FRA is implemented mainly through uh, village councils called the Gram Sabha. And the Gram Sabha is the first level arbiter of rights claims. So the FRA itself prescribes that all adult members in any given village should be on the Gram Sabha. But what tribal NGOs in the region have done is they've constituted these village councils consisting of exclusively tribal members. And so um, activists who drafted the FRA feel that what the tribal NGOs are doing is a violation of what the law prescribes. Um, so to really understand these contestations, uh, we need to understand the political climate in which negotiations around the FRA ensued. So uh, what I'll do today is I'll begin by sort of opening up that black box of policy making and going into the history of drafting the FRA and sharing with you some of what were very heated and contentious debates that took place during the drafting of this act. And um, these debates were not only about who would be eligible for rights or how they would establish their eligibility and what the rights would entail, but they were also very interestingly about the language in which these new rights uh, would be granted. So over what ideologies and histories words would call up, uh, what visions of justice or injustice they represented, and also how these words were imagined to be picked up and used by forest dwelling communities in the future. Um, I feel that looking at this history not only reveals something to us about the contestations around the boards, but also about the nature of policy itself. Um, that's to say, we usually tend to see policy as being prescriptive, as sort of offering static templates that are then applied into local contexts. And so when we assess policy, it's usually based on whether the policy has been implemented or not, or how successfully the policy has been implemented. But um, from a black letter law perspective alone, the FRA has not in any sense been implemented in good rule on the ground. Um, so rights claims have not been processed by the state at all. Um, but despite this, the FRA has been central to how communities in Goodlur sort of mobilize their own politics. And so in a Foucauldian sense, then, um, we can think of the law not just as a means of imposing power on subjects, but also a means within and through um, subjectivity, within and through which subjectivities are framed. So the law is sort of prescribing who can be deemed a good forest subject and who can't. So I see the FRA as offering communities many different scripts, different narratives, which contain various and sometimes competing notions of what justice is. And so in that sense, the FRA is um, a non-human actor that is opening up spaces of possibility to those who take up and use it. So what I'll do today is show you also how local actors in Gurulur take on the environmental subjectivities framed by the FRA, and how these subjectivities lend validity to some forms of contestation over others. So 
So um, I'll just tell you a bit now about um, the drafting process of this act. Um, it all begin, began in 2002 when uh, the Ministry of Environment and Forests in India ordered that all encroachments on forest lands needed to be evicted within five months. Um, this was then followed by a spate of violent evictions all over the country in which communities sort of found their homes raised to the ground, they found their crops destroyed, and in some places there was even violent confrontation with the forest department. Um, now the forest department's rationale for this was that in 1990 they had ordered that all forest settlements that existed before 1980 would be recognized. And so subsequent to that, all forest settlements um, were now automatically encroachments that then needed to be removed. Um, but the issue, of course, was that the 1990 orders had actually never been acted on, and these settlements had not, in fact, been recognized. Um, and uh, activists all across the country also argued that simply by virtue of recognizing these pre-1980 settlements, um, it's not that's not enough to then go ahead and deem forest dwellers as encroachers. Um, because simply because they don't have legal recognition um, doesn't account for the historical injustice that's been meted out to these communities via the principle of eminent domain in which the state is conceived of as automatically owning all lands that communities have actually traditionally used and occupied. Um, and um, that this principle of eminent domain then makes these communities illegal uh, on the lands that they themselves are traditional occupants of. Um, so after this, over the course of the next four years, these two words, historical injustice, would be cited again and again um, by activists, environmentalists, government officials and political leaders um, in all of the contestations that ensued around the drafting of the act um, until these words historical injustice actually found their way into the preamble of the act itself when it was passed in 2006. Uh, so after the eviction started as a response to them uh, civil society groups all across the country came together to form what was called the Campaign for Survival and Dignity um, in 2002. And uh, by the time the Congress Party of India came into power in 2004, what had begun as a campaign to resist these evictions had now grown into a demand for a new law. And uh, the Congress Party was realizing that forest-dwelling communities of the country consisted of sort of a swing constituency and that in order to maintain that voting bloc, they would need to meet the demand to redress historic injustice. And because the campaign itself, the Campaign for Survival and Dignity, was so central to articulating this demand, members uh, from the campaign were called upon to form half of the technical support group that would draft the act. Um, the other half of the committee were representatives from the Tribal Affairs Ministry of India. Um, and the Tribal Affairs Ministry was chosen as the nodal agency because the only other option within the government would be the Forest Department itself. Um, and the Forest Department already had vested interest in seeing communities removed from forest lands. But what happened when they gave the Tribal Affairs Ministry such a strong representation was that it already pitted the drafting process of the Act with these polarizing tensions. Um, so what we had at this point in 2004 was you had activists on the one hand and the government on the other, and they each had very different versions of justice that were being mobilized through this act. Um, so on the one hand, you had activists who were framing the issue very clearly as a response to evictions. Right? So they were seeking a legal tool that could help communities combat the power of the forest department. But for the tribal affairs ministry, um, it was their interest was a much more identity-based politics, and they were more concerned with representing their own constitu constituency, which is tribals in the country. Um, so when the first draft of the bill was passed, um, it granted rights to all communities who resided on forest lands in India before 2005. Um, but what happened was that the Tribal Affairs Ministry posed a very strong objection to this, uh, citing that tribal communities have suffered, again, historic injustice, 
at the hands of non-tribal communities who encroached on forest lands. So in this gene genealogy of justice, tribals are presented as being dispossessed from forests, while all other communities are complicit to this dispossession. So the compromise struck between these two competing demands at this stage um, was that the act would then automatically recognize rights for scheduled tribe communities, but then it would require that those communities who can't, are not classified as tribal need to have resided on forest lands before 1990. Um, and it appeared that a relatively stable compromise had been struck, um, and the act was set to be tabled in parliament. But um, what quite unexpectedly happened at this point was that conservationists in the country got wind that this act was being drafted. And um, the conservationists were never a part of the committee that was tasked with drafting the act or debating the act. But they then went on to play a very significant role in shaping the FRA as we know it today. Um, initially, the conservationists needed to work through personal networks that they had with the Congress Party of India because they had no official role. Um, and at this point, their concern was not articulated in opposition to the act itself. The conservationists were not contesting the narrative of historical injustice. They were only contesting the chronology. So according to this narrative, there were legitimate occupants of forests, lands, who lacked rights, but they were all tribals, and they all lived in their current habitations before 1980. So what they were suggesting was that the act excludes all non-tribal communities <coughs> and that the date for recognizing rights gets pushed back from 1990 to 1980. But um, what happened again after this was that the New Indian Express, which is one of the leading newspapers in the country, leaked a draft version of the act. And this then opened up the act to a whole new range of, con of constituencies in India who contested the versions of history and the scripts of justice that were being written into the law. So you no longer had just activists, the tribal ministry, the environment ministry, and conservationists contesting the act. You now had a whole range of publics who were weighing in on it. And this happened in these very polarizing terms of the public debate that was to ensue, which was tigers versus tribals. So as the name suggests, one faction of the debate was arguing that um, we need inviolate areas, that is, areas with no human habitation whatsoever, in order to conserve India's already fragile ecosystems, which host some of the last remaining tigers in the world. But you also had the other dwindling voice of activists that were reiterating that there has been historical injustice that forest dwelling communities have suffered. Um, but at this point, it was seeming unlikely that the act would get passed at all because there was such public outrage against it and especially India's middle class was squarely with the conservationists. And even if the act did get passed, there was next to no chance that non-tribal communities would find their way into it. So um, activists were directing their efforts primarily at getting some version of the act passed before that current session of parliament ended. Um, and the only remaining constituency that represented the needs of non-tribal communities was the left parties, that is, the Communist Party of India, Marxist. Uh, so members of the Communist Party rushed to intervene, and they argued that um, the large majority of forest-dwelling communities in India belong to non-tribal communities. And um, again, invoking the rhetoric of in historical injustice, they argued that an act passed without including non-tribal communities would do fresh injustice to them, and um, it wouldn't, in fact, redress historical injustice. Um, so finally, just two days before the act was passed in parliament, non-tribal communities were, in fact, given representation. But at this point, um, they, they were done, this was done only on the condition that these non-tribal communities could prove that they've decided on forest lands for three generations. So finally, you had an act that granted rights to all scheduled tribe communities and created a category called other traditional forest dwellers, um, which, which was communities who can prove residence on forest lands for three generations. And um, when the act was passed as such, 
activists all across the country protested it um, because they were saying that many communities in India um, that are tribal are not actually classified as tribal. And it's also often impossible for non-tribals to prove uh, legally the duration that they've lived on forest lands. Many of these contestations are actually echoed also in the way that political actors in Gurulur have used the FRA. Um, so until early 2016, the implementation of the FRA in Gurulur was completely suspended by a high court order. Um, so as soon as the FRA was passed, what also happened is retired forest department officials all across the country filed constitutional challenges against the act in the various high courts of the country. Um, and uh, so the court in Tamil Nadu ordered that all rights claims would have to be vetted by a court committee. Um, and this effectively stalled the implementation of the FRA completely in Tamil Nadu. But regardless of this complete non-implementation, uh, the FRA has still been central to shaping the way political actors in Gurulur articulate their politics. Um, as I mentioned previously, tribal organizations across the district have set up exclusively tribal Gram Sabhas, that is, the village councils which are responsible for arbitrating claims. And um, the way they've done this is by forming coalitions that include also a number of conservation organizations. Um, so this included uh, even the world famous WWF. Um, and this coalition of tribal NGOs and conservation organizations then uh, got the district administration to pass a special order sanctioning these exclusively tribal grants by the exclusively tribal village councils. Um, and uh, these NGOs have also been um, the main, uh, mainly responsible for uh, processing uh, the act through things like GPS mapping and uh, you know mapping out community forests, setting up ventures for ecotourism on land owned by the tribal NGOs. Um, The question here is really whether the tribal NGOs, uh, first of all, represent all tribal communities and whether non-tribals are therefore being excluded from ecotourism and community forestry ventures. So like I also mentioned, there are other organizations who work as trade unions or sort of mass organizations that are working towards very different political goals, um, which is uh, land rights for the Tamils, who I mentioned earlier, who've been sort of repatriated from Sri Lanka to India after having been sent there in the colonial period. Um, and uh, the other issue is, of course, conservation. Um, and so they've been opposing uh, the declaration of a tiger reserve that came up in 2007. And although these Tamils were brought to India under a bilateral agreement between the two governments, little has actually been done to ensure their land or labor rights. So the large majority of them are still landless and they work uh, very, as very precarious labor on tea plantations. And so they're vulnerable to the infringement of their labor rights as well. And so um, what these trade unions have done is that sort of in an effort to secure land rights, they've filed claims with the Ministry of Environment and Forests, um, which if you recall, agreed to recognize all pre-1980 settlements on forest lands. Um, what they've also done is formed these village councils, the Gram Sabhas, and their Gram Sabhas consist of all adult members in any given village. So not just tribals, but both tribals as well as non-tribals. Um, but only eligible members in these village councils have filed claims. So when I say eligible here, I'm referring to the provision that you have to be either a scheduled tribe or have resided on forest lands for three generations in order to file claims. Um, and the sort of the, the long argument and the reason that activists uh, believe that this kind of 
uh, claim making process is still relevant to the fight for Tamil land rights, um, despite knowing that technically Tamils don't qualify for rights under the Forest Rights Act, is that um, what they say is the FRA is primarily a process driven law. So what this means is that uh, merely by processing claims, they, op they open up new possibilities for political action. So simply filing a claim, even if the claim will be rejected, generates proof of residence. Um, and proof of residence itself is very hard to come by for these summers who have no other means of legal recognition. And so what this does is it adds weight to their fight for land rights under ongoing settlement processes. So this is sort of like a very expansive political project that thinks that conceives of different laws together and read different laws together to mobilize um, politics for land rights um, and sort of more class-based politics. Um, and uh, with protected area conservation also becoming more and more important in Gudalur, um, in 2007, just before the rules of the FRA came out, so just before the uh, FRA was actually going to be implemented, uh, the government very hurriedly made amendments to the Wildlife Protection Act. So the Wildlife Protection Act is the act under which um, uh, protected areas are declared in India. And what this sort of very hasty amendment allowed for was the declaration of tiger reserves without actually settling rights. And um, this is how the Mudumalai Tiger Reserve in Gudalur um, was declared in 2007. Um, and after this tiger reserve was declared in 2007, in 2009, the court also ordered a fresh set of evictions in this area um, by proposing an elephant corridor. Um, um, so uh, what activists have also done is use the FRA as a tool of resistance against these large conservation projects that are now coming up in their backyards. So um, when the Tiger Reserve was to be declared, tens of thousands of people took to the streets of Gudalur in massive protest because they felt that if their lands were to be part of the Tiger Reserve, um, they wouldn't be able to practice agriculture, collect firewood, or even access basic development facilities like electricity or roads. And um, many of them would also likely be relocated from their land. So um, they formed Gram Sabha's uh, village councils in this area, which consisted of all adult members in that village, both tribal as well as non-tribal. And uh, these village councils then passed resolutions against the declara declaration of the Tiger Reserve and the Elephant Corridor. And they then used the resolutions to file a case that is now pending with the Supreme Court of India. And the case primarily argued that rights had not been settled under the Forest Rights Act before declaring the Tiger Reserve and the Elephant Corridor. And um, now, although the final decision on this case is still pending with the Supreme Court, um, it has at least led to the potential evictions being canceled and um, the buffer zone for the Tiger Reserve has been curtailed. So um, that was just a sort of a bit of an overview of how the FRA has been used in Gurulu. Um, but I'd also like to tell you now a little bit about how these different actors relate to each other, given the differences in how they've gone about implementing the act. Um, As you might imagine, um, there's been quite a lot of contestation between them because some of the NGOs um, contend that this sort of conflation between land rights for Tamils on the one hand with forest rights for tribals on the other is a very dangerous one yeah. because they argue that Tamils don't actually meet the criterion for eligibility under the FRA. And so this use of the FRA by the trade unions is a violation of the law. And um, in addition to this legal objection, they raise a further ethical objection, which is that um, if you use the act in this way, it could leave room for other non-tribals, that is not just the Tamils, to sort of usurp this rights claiming process. 
Um, and with regards to the Tiger Reserve, they argue that it's anyhow only local resort owners and jeep drivers who feed protests against the reserve. So um, tribal, and they also say that uh, tribal communities have traditionally been completely excluded from the process of conservation. So when a protected area is declared, all communities are sort of wholesale relocated from the protected area, whether they're tribals or non-tribals. But in this instance, um, by 2007 with the Mudumula Tiger Reserve, we were sort of beginning to see some potential uh, for the forest department to actually work with tribal communities. So um, the NGOs were seeing this as a step to a more inclusive conservation agenda. And so they didn't see any reason to oppose the creation of the Tiger Reserve itself. But um, then, on the other hand, you have activists who in turn question um, the authority that the NGOs have to redefine the Gram Sabha, the village council. Um, and they argue that by forming these uh, special tribal Gram Sabhas consisting of only tribal members, um, the tribal NGOs are violating the law. And that a sort of a state NGO nexus has captured the process of implementation of the FRA. Um, and they contend that this act of forming Gram Sabhas of exclusively tribal members is also now creating sort of localized divisions and ex exacerbating conflict. And now it's sort of creating new mechanisms of local level gov governance that are then modifying the relationship between different stakeholders on the ground. And so it's solidifying boundaries between communities along the lines of identity. Um, and what happens when these, these lines of identity are solidified is that it militates against sort of collective solidarity and um, you know, uh, political mobilization against the state and against the forest department. Um, so for them, there's a very sort of class-based political imaginary in which um, large landowners and the state are conceived of as hegemonic forces that dominate the underclass. And uh, they assert that it's not local communities, but the forest department that should be seen as the biggest encroacher. Um, so uh, despite not actually have been, having been implemented again, the FRA has been of immense consequence. Um, in Gudalur, both materially, in terms of opposing the Tiger Reserve, as well as discursively in terms of creating these new environmental subjectivities. So in that sense, the law is a terrain of struggle. Um, it's not an immutable category, but it's a political instrument, a sort of a non-human actor that's mediating negotiations between political actors in Gudalur. So the way that the FRA itself is framed makes it a law in which multiple and sometimes conflicting ideologies are represented. So it's simultaneously an instrument of law with the purpose of recognizing rights, an act guided by the policy imperative of decentralizing forest governance, and an attempt at undoing historical injustice. Um, and these often quoted words, undoing historical injustice, are now written into the text of the law itself. And it's the very embeddedness of this, of history and of justice, that calls upon us to attend to the ways in which the law too is derived from a socio-political context. And it's in this that lies its capacity to invoke specific histories and arbitrate these ever contested versions of justice. Um, but what should, we should remember is that even in achieving these purposes, whether of recognizing rights, democratizing governance, or undoing injustice, the law also exercises a capacity to govern. Um, so I'd like to just quickly show you a small video clip at this point. And this video clip is one of, one of the tribal members who led a protest that happened in December 2014. And they were protesting the lack of implementation of the Forest Rights Act. I'm 
So, um, as you saw in the video, uh, he says that the law says that tribals have rights, uh, tribals are the original inhabitants. So, uh, I wanted to show you this just to show you how the law also exists in the mind of the, in the, mind of the tribal leader, that this is a very self-aware process, um, that these tribals know the kind of social capital and legal capital that their cultural identity affords them, and they're using it. So um, regarding this question about the tribal in the law, through both the drafting process of the uh, FRA as well as, as its implementation, the FRA has engendered fierce debate about the role and position of the tribal. Um, and while activists contend that the stringent restrictions placed upon non-tribals is a parochial and self-interested move by the Tribal Affairs Ministry, um, others also argue that the implementation of the Act too has been skewed in favor of a tribal constituency. Um, and I found these words um, sort of uh, reflected in uh, what a Tamil plantation laborer told me one day. Um, he asked me, uh, do you know how much more the forest department harasses us? Uh, now that they know that tribals have rights, they're afraid to do anything because uh, then some big NGO will have words with their higher officials. But we don't have anyone like that. Uh, every day they're putting cases against us and our people now have thousands of cases against them. So who will help us fight this? Or um, in the words of a tribal who practices informal gold mining uh, on the lands of a local tea estate, who said um, that it's okay for us tribals to practice illegal mining because the estate owner allows us, but not others. So when we take our Tamil friends and go, we pretend that they are also tribals. And um, by presenting these examples, I'm not attempting to erase the very real harassment that tribals are subjected to. Um, I'm not suggesting that they're not exploited. Uh, in fact, discrimination in all forms is still an immediate and tangible reality for tribals. Um, so just to cite one recent example, um, in November 2014, a group of tribal men were digging for gold in abandoned gold mines and they were actually caught by a patrolling for a stranger. And when they were caught, they were severely beaten up and uh, they suffered uh, grievous injuries. Um, so what I'm attempting to demonstrate instead is how the meanings attached to identity, uh, meanings which are codified and embedded within law, influence the ways in which estate owners or forest department officials come to either recognize or curtail rights. Or um, more importantly, the ways in which tribals or Tamils come to experience their own identities as either being constricting or, or enabling. So in that sense, the sphere of legislation is not limited to law books and courtrooms alone. The law is exercising a performative capacity of sorts. It's acting as an agent that goes forth into the world and in doing so gets translated and mediated through these local actors. And when identities are embedded within the law, these identities are then also mediated by this very performative power of legislation. So when we are citing the emancipatory potential of landmark laws such as the FRA, we must not forget that even in achieving that emancipatory potential, the law is modifying relationships and governing populations. I want to just bring you back for a moment to the notice boards that I showed you at the beginning of this talk. 
Um, so the, these notice boards were also actually put up as a response uh, to an already existing notice board from the forest department, uh, which declared that this land had been converted to forest land. And so this practice of putting up notice boards is a very common political tactic in Gurlu. So for example, I'll show you another board, um, which as you can see says, uh, the Supreme Court of India has prohibited any non-forestry activities, including clearing, cultivation, construction, etc., in uh, what are called Janmam lands in the entire Valley village. And any violation will entail severe action as per law. So um, these Janmam lands are sort of an oddity of land classification in Gurlur. So um, they belong to a pre-colonial system of land tenure. Uh, so in the pre-colonial period, you'd have ruling kings who would lease out large tracts of land, uh, lands to landlords. And then these land lords would then create subleases and subleases further to cultivators. And what happened in Gurlur is this essentially created a sort of a forest lease regime. And um, after India gained independence, we wanted to abolish all of these pre-colonial systems of land tenure. And so as a part of that attempt, the Janmam Abolition Act was passed in 1969. Um, so what that act was trying to do is remove the many layers of landowners and landlords that um, exist between the state, which is now the proprietary, proprietary owner of land and <coughs> cultivators. So, um, but when the act was passed, plantation owners in Gurulu took great issue with it because this meant that they would lose their lands and they challenged the constitutional validity of this act itself. And uh, they filed a case that is now still pending with the Supreme Court of India. And um, as a consequence of this uh, legal limbo, uh, land classification in Gurulu has been um, in a complete state of contestation for decades now. And um, the entire details of that is beyond what I have scope for right now. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that um, as a consequence of this legal limbo, what happened in Gurlur is that plantations and forests became very permeable categories in terms of classification. And um, this was only then complicated further when uh, the Supreme Court then extended the definition of forests in India to mean any lands that conform to the dictionary definition um, of forests. So uh, forest classification in Gurlu then does not correspond with on-ground realities. Uh, what on paper might conform to the dictionary definition of forests is often in practice a plantation, a small farm, a settlement, or in some cases, even a small town. And um, more importantly, these kinds of the bureaucratic processes that underlie these land classifications remain completely invisible to people in villages, um, at least until they announce themselves with the unwelcome presence of these notice boards. Um, even just last month, uh, new notice boards were erected, and this time they invoked the colonial era legislation, uh, the Tamil Nadu Land Encroachment Act from 1905. Um, so people uh, in villages in Gurlur live with a looming threat of eviction because um, what is constantly happening is that uh, the state and the forest department more particularly is attempting to convert land um, into forests. And so people are always afraid that they could wake up to find these notice boards in their village um, or they could return home after a day's work to find that their houses have been demol demolished in extreme circumstances or that their crops have been destroyed. And so um, for these villagers, the problem then is not so much that the law is inaccessible. So it's not a question of access to justice. Um, the law, in fact, enters and invades their everyday life in a number of ways. Um, these villagers are only too familiar with negotiating bureaucratic processes, um, both within the state machinery as well as with civil society groups from whom they enlist support, uh, perhaps to file a case against the forest department official who's been harassing them, or to uh, fight one of the numerous cases that have been filed against them. Um, the problem they're facing instead is one of legal indeterminacy. That is, you have competing and often contradictory forest legislations in Gurur, 
And what this does is it makes forests themselves spaces of legal ambiguity. And this legal ambiguity makes these spaces available for contestation to be claimed by whichever stakeholder employs the most successful tactics. Um, what I also want to point out here is that these contestations are playing out across multiple scales. Um, while the actors in my narrative have so far been portrayed as distinct entities, so I've had the state, the NGO, the activist, and so on, um, this provides only a partial analysis of the ways in which power functions in practice and how different people negotiate and respond to this. Um, these actors are not, in fact, distinct. They're all equally embedded in a localized context. So what I'm referring to, for example, is um, a forest watcher who is himself from a local village or a tribal uh, who is also this, a senior member in an NGO or an activist who is himself a repatriated Tamil. Um, and it's really here at this level that we begin to see how categories become nebulous and boundaries begin to blur. Um, the question really is, what do these words mean for the tribal who lives in the village and possibly doesn't know what it means when he hears the words Forest Rights Act or Gram Sabha, right? He might not know who put the words there or why, but perhaps what he does know is that the local traditional tribal leader, who now has a house with electricity and a good salary, doesn't care for his problems any longer. What he does know is that um, he's been trying to get electricity and good roads for his village. But he's repeatedly told that he lives on forest land, and so these facilities can't be provided. What he does know is that every evening when he walks home from the nearby forest where he works as an informal gold miner, he may run into a rogue elephant. And these are concerns that he then has to articulate through these often competing voices and uh, the politics of various political actors. Um, so he has to maintain, for example, friendly relations with the forest watcher so that the next time uh, a forest guard comes uh, on a raid in his village, he will receive the news in advance. Um, he volunteers and participates in NGO meetings so that maybe he can secure an agricultural loan or two. Or he talks to the researcher who visits always with a hundred questions in the hope that she could help him apply for and finally receive the pension that he's been promised from the government. So the various political actors in my narrative are constantly sort of constructing these binaries, right, of oppression and resistance. For example, the founder of the trade union uh, constructs this binary of the forest department and the state as a sort of singular hegemonic force against which the working class must unite in solidarity. Um, but perhaps power is not located quite as simply and quite in that binary. Um, here we see a range of places and situations in which relations of power are played out. Um, namely that you have the FRA as a sort of non-human actor influencing relations of power at two levels. Um, firstly, when it's adopted by various political actors in the region, um, it mediates the relations between these actors um, and between these actors in the state um, and with the common man. And as a result, at another level, it's altering the life worlds, if you will, of the subaltern who I've spoken about, who now has to articulate his concerns within and through whatever agency and these multiple scripts that are afforded to him by the political actors. Thanks, Mercy. It was extremely interesting. Um, I'm sure there's quite a few questions uh, in the front Can I start by asking a couple myself? Uh, the first is just a very quick one, which was about the plantations and the labor on plantations. So, presumably, there's Tamils, but there were also Dalits with them. You know, brought to uh, this area 120 years ago, something like that, 150 years ago. Uh, the, the Sri Lankan Tamils, who'd also presumably moved at the same time to Sri Lanka, have now been repatriated, not repatriated, but now been brought back to India through this bilateral ex exchange scheme. Um, but neither of them have a claim on the plantation. 
at all. Mm -hmm. So the second part of the question was about the idea of rights and what people have rights in. Because clearly there's one group there, which is an SC group, which is your caste, mm -hmm. uh, that have been that can claim residence for over 100 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but those sorts of rights to land are never going to be granted. Mm -hmm. Rights in the forest. Mm -hmm. and, in, and, and you sort of mentioned about an legal definition or a dictionary definition of forest, but actually what we're talking about is not forest, we're talking about land owned by the forest department. Uh, the um, what's the nature of the, the can you just say a little bit more about the nature of the rights that are given to the people under the Forest Rights Act of 2006? Is it the right to reside? And what sorts of rights do they have to use or even to extract resources commercially from the forest? Right, so I'm, I'm sort of hearing a number of questions yeah, in that. Let me just sort of. As I say, there really, there's so many ways of looking at this. Absolutely, they're, they're all very interesting questions that you've raised. And so I'm not sure. First, are you asking um, how long and what are the different groups of uh, Dalit scheduled caste communities that reside in this area? Secondly, um, what is the distinction between the plantation and the forest? Who has rights to plantations? Yeah. Who has rights to forests? And thirdly, again, the, the definition of what a forest is. And, and sorry, right? the fourth question, what rights do what the forest have? Okay, right, so I'll try to sort of go about it. Sorry, it's a very long series of questions. These, these issues are sort of all conflated, like I said. Yeah. So when you think about one thing, you have to think about all the other things, which is what makes it so immensely complex and so immensely interesting, um, which is why you have all of these contestations in the first place. So um, I'll begin with the question of, um, Dalits. So Dalits are scheduled castes in India, and so in India's caste system, they sort of occupy the lowest rung of the caste system. And so, like I mentioned, there are possibly two sets of Tamils who um, uh, occupy these lands in Gudalur. Um, although I must also add here that that groups are not and quite as distinct. Um, you also have plantation laborers from Karnataka who are not Tamil or from Kerala, um, who settled in the colonial period. So yes, the large majority of um, Tamils who were brought in the colonial period to work on the colonial plantations are Dalits. Um, and then you did the Tamils from Sri Lanka are originally Tamils uh, who, are, who are Indian Tamils, they're not Sri Lankan Tamils. And they were in fact repatriated officially by both governments. So they were granted Indian citizenship once again. Um, does that answer your first question? About yes, it does, yeah. yeah. Um, the second one could just remind me was about was the, about the nature of the rights. So first of all, the resource really is is not forest itself because in some definitions you wouldn't include plantation of that, but it's land owned by the forest department. Mm -hmm. And the nature of those rights is not ownership rights, is it? It's mm -hmm. rights to reside. It's meta, so it's a number of different rights, it's a number of different land classifications. And the reason that I didn't entirely go into that history is that because of the Janam Act that I mentioned, this land is essentially um, large tracts of the land are disputed and there's no certainty of what the classification is. So the land is constantly caught in a tussle between the revenue department and the forest department. So what will happen in practice is that Sure, if you were to dig into the records, which the forest department will never give you, you might find that, okay, the land is in fact classified uh, under the forest department or not. But in practice, you have the revenue department which will go put up a board and say this land is Porambok land uh, or this land is a village. Then you have the forest department which will come and put up a board and say this land is classified as a forest under section 53 of the act. Um, so basically all of these Janmam lands um, when the Janam Act was passed, are classified under what is called Section 17. So if you go to someone in Gudalur and you say, what, la what, is, what land is this? This Section 17 is something that you hear all the time. And Section 17 essentially means that this land could be, at any point, used by the government um, or converted by the government as to a forest. So in practice, there's really no certainty of, about whether that land is. So you could be living on a plantation and the forest department will put up a board and they'll say, no, 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 it's not section 17. Uh, didn't you know that it, like for the last five years, it's been section 53 and you're all illegal. And um, don't you remember that those people who lived here before you, their crops were raised and it was because they don't have any legal right to cultivate these lands. Um, that's the sort of thing that would happen. Um, so, uh, so in that sense, 
uh, you could also have land that is completely forested and you have natural vegetation, which is what all the conservationists are going going after, right? The, the indigenous species, species and conservationists are extremely concerned about invasive species, right? So you have Lantana, for example, which has really invaded the forests of Kudalu. Where, where do you find the most amount of Lantana is within the tiger reserve, within the protected area, and where you find the most natural vegetation that is un, untouched by untouched by human habitation is in the middle of the village or right on the border of the village. And that land is not classified as forest land or not under the protected area at all. So I hope that gives some sense of the, the uncertainty and therefore the way those uncertainties are constantly contested in practice. Um, and in terms of the kinds of rights the FRA is giving, what the FRA did legally is quite radical in India's legal system. So the FRA was not just saying that we are granting rights to communities. The FRA was saying that we are recognizing already existing rights and we are correcting the historical injustice. So in addition to uh, providing a series of rights, the FRA is sort of also invoking in its preamble this, this overarching vision of justice, right? And in terms of the rights itself, you have um, three categories of rights. You have individual rights, which mean that individuals have the right to land title for up to four acres of land. You have community rights, which means access to forest products, that is um, timber, um, you know, gooseberry that might grow in the forest, any, any kind of uh, plant, medicinal plants, um, that sort of thing. <coughs> Um, access to development facilities in forest villages. Um, so a lot of these forest villages don't have any kind of facilities. They don't have solar panels, they don't have uh, street lights, they don't have, of course, electricity within the home is inconceivable. They don't have roads, um, they don't have uh, anganwadis, which are sort of like crashes. Um, so the, the Act provides for those access to those development facilities under these community rights. And the Act also provides for these com concomitant obligations and responsibilities that go under rights when you declare what is called a community forest. So there's a process of mapping that happens where communities get together and map what, what are the lands that they've traditionally used. And then that becomes a community forest that the village council is responsible also for conserving. Um, does that give you a sense of sort of the, the diverse yeah. and exhaustive nature of rights to reside, own, use, access, not just forest produce, but also development facilities that they have already provide? There, there were many more questions I could ask. I'm sorry, but I don't know. That was a very interesting question. Thanks. Yeah, so anything else after I've sort of given you this overwhelming barrage of information? <laughs> One of the examples you gave in your response now was about, um, I think, responsibility being shifted between two government departments. Um, I don't have much, I haven't read much into forest rights yet. It's coming up in this way, but um, how do you find communities being responsible? So I know this generally that in action, you know, communities can write this or agree, but. Um, when they say that the government needs to take charge of this and they take it on, but they're still tussled within departments. Like how, how do you find the responses that way? They are taking up, but still no action. Um, are you asking how communities respond to this yeah. sort of tussle between government departments? Yes. Right. Um, well, communities are really um, quite confused, I think, um, uh, because uh, there's, like I mentioned, this sort of const constant uncertainty as to what are the kinds of rights that they have on their lands. Is the village that they live in even like on paper a village? So there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a big issue uh, to do with uh, the classification of villages itself because the FRA provides that all forest, vi all villages inside forests need to be converted from what's called a revenue village to a forest village. Now, whether you're a revenue village or a forest village entitles you to different kinds of rights. So now communities are asking why they haven't been converted to forest villages, uh, despite the fact that they're within forest lands. Um, 
so the issue really is that um, all of the all of the uncertainty and contestation provides a very convenient out for the government to then completely erase rights claims um, in all in all the ambiguity. Uh, uh, what is the nature of the, the nature of a revenue village is slightly different um, because uh, if uh, because a revenue village cannot uh, technically exist on forest lands, so the revenue village will then be relocated depending on the kind of classification that the forest is. So if it's a reserve forest or anything beyond that, a protected area, the revenue village would be relocated. But what the FRA says is no, first convert the revenue village to a forest village, let communities decide if they want to stay within the forest or not, and then let the process of relocation be something that is consensual. So revenue villages give uh, automatic rights to development facilities, but they don't give similar rights to accessing forest produce. Um, whereas forest villages under the FRA sort of account for both together. They account for the fact that communities dwelling on forest lands need to access development facilities on the one hand, and they also need to access forest produce on the other. So the same land keeps changing from forest to uh, village to revenue village. Uh, not necessarily from forest village to revenue village. Um, it changes um, from section 15 under the uh, section 17 under the Janma Act to section 53 of the Janma Act, which then has different implications for what a village on that kind of land can be. Does that make sense? So, what is that pattern? Do they just do it randomly at any point? It's increasingly aggressive. It's increasingly what is happening is that. Uh, lands are being converted to forests because forests are so important to the region and conservation is so important to the region. So once the, the, there's a change from uh, revenue to forests, how do the locals react to that? I mean, like I said, when there's a change... Are they protected? Are they uh, given other areas for staying or... No, in fact, even from within the Tiger Reserve, um, there are some communities within the Tiger Reserve who has, who've been simply fed up for years now because they feel that um, there's no hope in sight for uh, them to realize the rights that they have within the protected area to access development facilities. And they went to the court and said, relocate us as per your own, um, your own procedures under the Tiger Reserve. But what's also happening in India with, in terms of the ways that funds are being allocated for tiger reserves is that it's becoming what I would contend is increasingly neoliberal where before you had the National Tiger Conservation Authority which had the funds to relocate communities. Now you have the Compensatory Afforestation Fund which is um, the fund into which uh, money from corporate social responsibility programs goes um, and that fund is now being now needs to be directed to the Tiger Conservation Authority. And by the time all of that bureaucratic uh, hassle happens, um, communities are living within the Tiger Reserve for years and years with access to no facilities whatsoever. And they're now facing um, increasing number of wildlife deaths. They're being killed by tigers. Um, so, uh, so, you know, a few years ago, it was simply that the forest department would uh, come and destroy their crops when some when an area was being converted to forest. But for communities that are now also find themselves stuck, on the other hand, within tiger reserves, these are the very different kinds of issues that they face. So, is it more political or bureaucratic? Like, so the, does the change of government every five years also has a big role on how uh, their type of land is changed? I mean, I'm not entirely sure about this, that the bureaucracy is political. It's not so much about which party is in power. I feel like it's more about um, the larger vested interests of large landowners and conservation and the forest department, really, that um, is, a, is a force in the state that has increasing amounts of power vested in it uh, with these forest lands. and. Um, the interest there, of course, is that it's much easier to have the forest department work with large plantation owners and work with the timber mafia to find loopholes for them to continue to 
um, extracting words. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a very interesting question. Um, I guess I would say that in this situation, um, economic growth and conservation are not entirely at odds with each other when you have the forest department being granted so much power. So in terms of how the forest department has so much power, um, I mentioned the Supreme Court and this dictionary definition, right? Um, and that was one of the sort of, it's been um, argued as a case of judicial overreach, where the ju judiciary does not actually have um, the discretion to define forests in this way, because what it's also done is it's required that um, a judicial, a committee, like a separate forest bench, then legislates on all issues on forest lands. So even if you have issues as minor as who is allowed to pick up a dead tree from a forest in Goodlood, you have a forest bench in the Supreme Court of India that has forest officials sitting on it that is deciding on that very minor issue. Um, and the reason that I don't see the sort of economic growth and conservation as being so antithetical to each other is that what is essentially happening here is that when you give, when you grant local communities access to uh, forest rights, that stalls uh, development, right? And that's the effort here. That when when you conserve but you um, maintain the the power of the forest department, um, then the state still has um, the, the capacity to allow for timber mafias and allow for large plantation owners, uh, which is what is happening in Gurulur, um, and um, allow for even protected areas to be directed to non-forest purposes. So even though you have a tiger reserve there, um, uh, the, the state still has the right under these kinds of tiger reserves to convert that land for non-forest purposes. But if you declare a protected area under the Forest Rights Act, you would need to go through um, forest dwelling communities first and settle their rights, and only then can that uh, forest land be diverted for industry or infrastructure, whatever it might be. So essentially, it's much easier this way for infrastructure and industry to take over. Does that make sense? It's quite complicated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the then a few, a few comments and, and then uh, we'll be to question. Yeah, I found the talk very, very interesting for all kinds of reasons. Uh, uh, partly for uh, sort of topics we discussed that one of the lectures today around restrictive ideas of policy as opposed to policy as process and seeing how this is a perfect example of how a policy emerged through a very complex process of contestation between different actors and all of that. And uh, interestingly, in this case, it's also one of the cases students will be looking at um, as an example of the transformative action. Yeah. yeah, so I think it's really interesting from that perspective. Uh, I also find it really interesting. I mean, this is about the first time I'm hearing that um, the forest law would grant more rights for development, rights to, to have roads, and which is really interesting, which makes the law a uh, little bit radical uh, or transformative. Uh, compared to what you would expect of forestry departments who are always on, on the defense when it comes to development projects. And in fact, in, in Nigeria and the cases that I've studied in the past, you have uh, the World Bank and all these other uh, donor agencies insisting that no development project of this kind should happen in natural forests, so, so that even when the state proposes, say, road construction in certain forest areas, these agencies would not fund those particular projects, they would fund the ones outside. So to now see forestry departments that is in fact proposing this and writing this into law makes me feel this, this is really interesting, it's, a, it's an interesting case to look at. But a flip side of this law is also the ways in which this law might be disciplining foresters themselves. So, and you didn't talk about that quite much, you, you focused a lot on, which is understandable. But 
what are the ways in which first time themselves are trying to grapple with the, the sort of some of the rights that I think has been sort of exist away from from them, say to to these um, um, scheduled tribes, who probably now cover more more grounds in terms of their their claim over over forest areas, over all kinds of activities that go on the forest. So so another way of looking at this particular issue is to think of would well, the forestry department have uh, granted the same sort of rights to those people on its own without the other contestations and from NGOs here, the, the tribal committee you mentioned, and a few other people who sort of ensure that this law went beyond just protecting the forest, but granted significant rights. To, so would foresters on their own would have conceived of this kind of law that sort of um, gives more, more rights to people beyond just protecting the forest. So and how is this law sort of disciplining foresters themselves? Are they sort of also submitting to the to the dictates of this law even when doesn't look hmm. Well, absolutely not to answer um, the, the first part of your question. And in fact, the forest department was not um, involved in the drafting of this law. I, I imagine that if the, like I mentioned, it was initially the activists on the one hand and the tribal affairs ministry on the other. And that was a very strategic move by the prime minister's office because if the forest department um, and the ministry of environment and forestry was brought in at that stage, there would have been much more opposition and much more pushback for a law like this. Um, however, what what that um, that political interest has done is within within the parameters that this law allows um, allows for. It's pushed for a very 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 small constituency to be allowed the rights. So it's pushed for just scheduled tribes to be allowed <laughs> rights and all other communities to essentially be excluded by, by you know, uh, creating this provision that says you must prove that you've resided on forest lands for three generations. That is effectively excluding them because you cannot prove that you've resided on forest lands for three generations. And um, in, in that sense, that, that is how discipline is happening because, um, sure, if, if the forest department um, were to grant rights for scheduled tribe communities, there would be such a small fraction of those communities that dwell on those forests that it would not affect the power um, and the, the total amount of land that the forest department has under its control, which is really what the forest department is ultimately interested in, which is staking claims on more and more land. And it would sort of um, aid uh, projects of the forest department, such as um, you know ecotourism, or just in terms of you know they have these what are called anti-poaching watchers. Um, uh, because they need people who can uh, work in the forest department and um, sort of uh, work on issues of poaching. And it's really only the tribal uh, members of tribal communities that can do that. Um, they need people who can work with uh, the elephants to tame elephants. Um, and they keep elephants who um, are around to keep and check other elephants that might go rogue. So for all of these purposes, or even just for tourism, um, it, uh, Tribals have a very large representation within the forest department, but like you mentioned, that is a sort of disciplining force um, in which um, a very, very certain kind of identity is offered privileges and rights and only in a very narrow, constricted sense. So even though there are tribals there, they occupy only the lowest realm of the forest department. Um, and you know, if, uh, even when they're encouraged to take up their own projects, they're encouraged to do so along with NGOs who will work with the forest department. So, so this law sort of favors the forest department even more or doesn't detract from their own powers? The law itself attempts not to favor the forest department by sort of writing about historical injustice, but the law has been co-opted and there's been a lot of pushback in the way that the law has been read very creatively. Um, I'm not sure about the, the link between, I, I mean, it seems like the forest department has very specific objectives. So I'm wondering uh, what's the link between the local actors in the forest department and what's their interest and uh, how, how the forest department as a you know, big department um, makes this, these objectives seep down to, to the people who are actually on the land and putting up notice boards and moving people around. 
Um, I'm not sure like if, if everybody in here has got the same interests or, or not. You're not sure if everybody within the forest department has the same interests? Yeah, that. and also okay. I was wondering maybe this links in if uh, this kind of situation happens in other areas or mm -hmm. if it's just in uh, uh, in Tamil Nadu on the, on the border with uh, Kerala and Karnataka. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Right. No, you're, you're absolutely right in saying that um, you know the forest department is not this sort of monolithic entity, that there are um, forest department officials at many levels. Um, and like I mentioned, there are also forest guards and forest rangers who are sort of occupying more of the lower rungs of the forest department. Um, and I guess that that speaks a little bit to questions of structure and agency in that when, um, for example, a tribal in a village uh, is practicing illegal gold mining, um, what is technically supposed to happen is the forest department is supposed to crack down on it. Uh, but because the forest watcher is also a tribal member from the same village and knows the people, uh, possibly has familiar relations, uh, however distant, with the people who are practicing illegal mining. They can um, either curry a favor or pay a bribe to this forest watcher to simply overlook um, and also perform the function of warning um, the members who are practicing illegal mining when higher officials are going to come and inspect these illegal gold mines. So there are a lot of fractures within the uh, within the, the sort of overarching structure, and people use the affordances allowed by these fractures in order to continue to take advantage of the nebulous liminal space that a forest, a plantation, a mine is. Mm -hmm. So, um, can you can you tell me if I'm wrong? I'm not sure if I understood correctly that the, the interests of the forest department in uh, expanding the forest and uh, displacing people and that reason like all these castles of course, is, uh, you said, from ecotourism, that they, do, that they can have, uh, you know, uh, develop that. And uh, you talked about anti vouching vouchers and stuff like that. Am I missing out on something else? I'm, I'm just not sure what the... I think I'm not used to it, to this because, like, um, uh, in, I come from Italy, so like, pe it's generally like the other way around. So, like, uh, uh, she was saying, it's more about development and growth than conservation. It's more of a less, much less aggressive. It's more like on the side, and it's more of like a resistance kind of thing. So, I'm, I'm not really sure what the interest, the, the, you know, the core interest of the forest department is. And, uh, displacing people and making the forest, establishing the forest. Yeah, well, um, like I mentioned, conservation is very important to um, this region because it's been declared by the UNESCO as a World Heritage Site. It's been declared as a biosphere reserve. Um, it hosts uh, some of the last remaining populations of tigers um, in the world, and it's, you know, has one of the highest population of tigers in India, and it hosts the world's largest population of Asiatic elephants. Um, so at many levels, uh, state, national, and international, uh, the agenda of conservation has a very strong role. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a very particular kind of conservation. It is the um, sort of the fortress mode of conservation, which sees communities more or less as being completely antithetical to the project of conservation, mm -hmm. and so simply rides roughshod over rights. Mm -hmm. And um, the implications of that mode of conservation also is that it's not a very effective uh, mode of conservation for the purposes of preserving ecosystems themselves, because legally it, um, it centralizes power with the forest department and allows for infra infrastructure projects and allows for industry and allows for uh, large plantations. So you still have large areas of, of this region that are overtaken by tea and coffee plantations. Um, you still have infrastructure projects like hydroelectric projects that are going on. Um, so, you, so this allows for development, it allows for some sort of nominal conservation. What it doesn't allow for is the rights of communities and the rights of the most marginalized people. Is that? I think it's also important to reflect on the history of forest conservation, especially in India. You know, mm -hmm. India used to be the the powerhouse for British colonial conservation. You know. mm -hmm. It was from India that 
all the other, that forest has been sent out to all the other colonies, mm -hmm. all the other British colonies, so that forest in India has been a big thing historically. It's been a very prestigious uh, department also of the states, and so some of its power also derives from the forest so department. You know, it has forest management. And the ability to extract resources systematically and rationally. Yeah, so it's that German model of forestry. Yeah, so it's more forest conservation, not conservation, and more conservation. Yeah. Of, uh, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about, about this particular case is, is the way, not just, you know, the, the idea that uh, the identity of Adivasis changes, you know, this idea of increasing the idea of indigeneity. To make a claim through through rights, mm -hmm. but also how the resources change over time. You know, the, the, it wasn't considered a resource when the tea plantations were opened up. You know, it was considered jungle in a very sort of provocative sense. The tigers were burning. You know, people were paid for exterminating tigers. And then over time, you know, you have this idea. The real uh, Adivasi land, the, the historical injustice, was when they were thrown off the land where the tea plantations are, because mm -hmm. they were cleared, and that was presumably where they lived. And then. You know, you go through this process where, where timber is valuable, uh, and so the forest department takes over. And now, you know, there's other ways of, of, of extracting benefit from a resource like a forest, be through ecotourism or, or uh, wildlife uh, as a habitat, or presumably as a sort of a carbon sink, which is a next sort of, you know, phase that maybe we haven't seen yet. But, you know, it's going to be interesting then, you know, how people will make claims on, on these areas. And I think there'll be another sort of no, so it's, it, resources are dynamic, they're not static and in the same way as identity and these claims change as, as the resource changes. Yeah, absolutely, resources are dynamic and like you said that uh, the next thing that we're seeing is sort of um, carbon offsets and forests seen um, in the light of that and you already have so um, in uh, early last year they changed the definition of forests again. And looking at this new definition of forest has all of this technical jargon, right? It has crown density and contiguity and uh, the percentage of nat natural vegetation and so on and so forth. And if you sort of look closely at the jargon, what the definition is doing is sort of making legible what can be used for the purpose of carbon offsets. Right, yeah. And will that include certain types of plantation, as in, in say, Malaysia? Where palm oil plantations are, are classified as eligible for rent plus schemes. Mm. I think there's still a lot of debate on, yeah. on the eligibility of plantations. Um, uh, I know countries that have massive plantations are fighting for the inclusion of plantation. Of course, right. at the international level, I'm not sure they've reached some agreement. Yet. Yeah, I mean, that hasn't happened as yet, but I imagine that that exact thing is going to happen that plantations are going to be uh, mm. seen as eligible because the way the definition is phrased is. Um, so complex that mm. I, I imagine that you could read in any okay. version of okay there's crown density if it's if rights have been settled before 1980 mm. all of those sort of very very technical uh, permutations and combinations can likely be very easily manipulated mm. to suit the purpose of what mm. what we want to offset carbon. Mm. I'm sure we could go on, but it's getting late. Um, I, just again, thanks for that. It's a really interesting speech and an interesting uh, discussion afterwards. So thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you.